Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. All right, yeah, I'm a little rusty, but we're back. This is the Rich Redman Show. I'm, of course, joined by my co-host, co-producer, longtime friend, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. Jim, what is up? Oh, my goodness. It's been a minute, huh? It has been a minute. When you're trying to write a book, you know, I had this book in the works for like six years, and then my co-author, Jennifer DeLazana, went ahead and got us a publishing deal. So I was like, great, we got to write this book. So we, a year of our life, we put the book out, making it in Country Music and Insiders Look at the Industry. and uh, But now we're back to the podcast, and uh, we are in for a treat today. I This gentleman, he's just, there it is. And if you're watching this on video, Jim is being really strange and holding up the, the book. Go get it Strange. on Amazon. Dude, it makes a great I'm trying Christmas to Vanna gift. White it. You're, <laughs> you're nuts, man. Well, this is so fun. Um, you know, uh, this guy is just good. He is just a good drummer. I'm just like impressed. Like we're we're in the same industry, but we're like riding two different buses and we never get to really see each other play. I think we were booked on the same bill a couple months back um in New Jersey on the Jersey Shore. Uh yeah. But uh, yeah, but we're going to put our hands together for the long time drummer with Dustin Lynch and it's Billy Joe Freeman. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? Welcome to the show. Doing good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, man. Award winning uh, Dustin Lynch. He's been around for about a decade or so since I think his first record dropped in 2012. And you were telling me you were, you had had the job for 10 years coming up on 11 years. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, and significant less gray is when I started with him. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's you know what's crazy um is that as a general rule people move to Nashville and they usually have to take a step back to take a step forward so they're eating ramen noodle they're maxing out credit cards they're crashing parties you moved to Nashville with the job I believe yeah. now that is incredible yeah. tell us about the tell us that story well uh I went through that ramen stage uh, back in Texas Yes, um, and kind of got into the industry there. And, uh, you know, I, we actually uh, talked earlier this week about uh, the Big G Jamboree. So that's yes. that's where I got my start playing. OK, so take us back even further, because one story will inform the other. We do have this beautiful relationship with Texas. I kind of cut my teeth and got my education in Texas. But you grew up in the big G Garland, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas, Texas. Yes. Very quaint. Yeah. So in Garland, they, they had a, at the time, the Garland country music association, right. which, you know, they had the big G jamboree every Saturday night. And, uh, there were several different formats, but the, they would have different bands come in and play. They would have different guest singers come in. Sometimes they just have a house band and, uh, yeah, so my parent, my mother was singing there uh, and then liked the people that were involved and just uh, started volunteering. And uh, so she she would sing on Saturday night and then volunteered to clean the place up after the show Sunday mornings. Wow. So I'd go up there with her and, uh, you know, while she was cleaning, I would be looking around at the band stuff and, and <laughs> You know, the drums were really the only thing that I could get any noise. You know, there was no guitar. There were amps, but no guitars. And, you know, but the drums were there. Yeah. So I could kind of like make a little noise on them. And and one of the guys, uh, one of the drummers up there at some point when I was four uh, said, hey, you need to get him some drum lessons. And uh, so you were four I years old. Is that what it when it started? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really young because I, I, I say, you know, I. Started studying in 1976 when dinosaurs roamed the earth, but I was six years old. Four is really, really young, man. So, yeah. and so you had musical parents. Did your dad, was your dad a musician as well? Yeah. So he played piano oh, cool. in one of the bands down there as well. Like he ended up volunteering as well. And, uh, and so, yeah, man, uh, I was just around all the time, kind of, you know, in the wings, watching the drummers and, and just eating it up. Yeah. You know? And, and the, so that the, was, the jamboree is kind of like a, it's kind of like for those people that are like city slickers, they're like a jamboree. It's kind of like an Opry format, right? It's like yes. a variety show. So a couple acts will come through during the evening, 
either the house band backs him up or maybe they have their own. Am I yeah. right? That was the format. Yeah. So uh, in that area specifically, you know, Big G Jamboree ended up becoming the Garland Opry. Gotcha. In that area, they also had the Mesquite Opry. They had uh, Johnny High's Country Music Review, mm -hmm. uh, the Wiley Opry. That was one too. You know, there were there were a handful in that. The Great yeah. Vine Opry. That was another one. Yeah. Um, yeah. All those. It, it was a big scene. There it was right after. Uh, you know when when Leanne Rhymes took off in the '90s. Every little girl that could kind of sing wanted to come sing at the opera on the weekend and, yeah and uh so yeah man that, it was a it was a nice vibrant music scene to be a part of and not only that but kind of pick up on how uh the musicians would hang you know in the downtime it's just i just grew up around that so yeah you know, hanging out on a tour bus or, or, you know, doing music, it's just always kind of come naturally. Cause I just was around that growing up. The people and, skills and interacting. Yeah. And, yeah. The interpersonal relationships. I mean, yeah, you're a great hang dude. I mean, it's like, you know, just, <laughs> just totally natural. So, so you, hey, what was the first beat you played? Was it the old boom oh. smack when you got on the kid or were you like, you know, you know, double basing out or something, you know? Oh no. So <laughs> I remember, uh, Man, uh, there's a song called "She's Waiting." It's oh uh, yeah, Eric Clapton tune. Is that uh, Phil Collins on drums? Uh, might be. It's, I, think uh, it, I think it may have been Phil Collins. You know all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, she's waiting. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Jim knows because he's a radio man. And I, yeah, I remember That's right, uh, playing that. And then uh, Gloria Stefan had a, a record out at the time uh, that was like, uh, Get On Your Feet. That was the single. Yeah, Get On Your Feet. A lot of six it was feet. stuff at the time that was, it, whatever was coming on the radio. I had a little jam box that I would set on my windowsill behind my, where my drum set was set up in my room. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in those days, it was just on the, whatever you could do or record off of the radio. But my, my, uh, the teacher at the time, uh, sent me home with waiting for Columbus, that little feet record. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I started playing Dixie chicken and stuff like that. Real, real young. That is great. And, well, Jim is holding up his finger. He wants to interject. A little yes. bit of a, a factoid. Phil Collins, uh, was not the drummer, but he did, play the snare drum that comes in at the end oh yeah like on that song was uh jamie oldiker wow okay. yeah he was the guy that played our wonderful tonight and um lay down sally and all that early stuff and we lost him a couple years back god rest his soul he, he was they went on to be in a band called the tractors yeah oh wow yeah remember those guys I did produce that song well that was your version of dropping the needle so you're just probably just one or one and a half generations behind me because we used to have to drop the needle and we would also like oh, yeah. re record, have a, have a boom box and then record the r hits from the radio onto a cassette. Yes. <laughs> so before I, I got my kit and probably while I had it too, I had uh, my parents collection of 45s. Yeah. So I would go through all those and, you know, Springsteen and Doobie brothers and, and that kind of thing was, I'm really into all that. Yeah. Now, did you yeah. have a teacher? Like, who was, was there like the, the teachers in the area, like the Henry Oxtels and the, who was teaching? And did, were you aware of our buddy, Dan Wojciechowski? He was kind of like a oh, legend yeah. in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. So that was interesting. I probably, you know, five years old to eight years old, I learned from Mike McMinnemy. Okay. It was a drummer that was playing at the Opry some. And, uh, you know, I, I remember him telling me back in the day that he had, uh, he played in a band that opened up for fog hat or something like that. I know he was an old rock and roll guy. Yeah. And man, what he did with me at that age was, uh, you know, he would send me home with, with different records or cassette tapes. And, uh, and then when I would come back the next week, it was every Saturday, Saturday afternoon, I would go over to his house and he had this big double bass pearl export kit. Nice. And, uh, 
And he would just say, hey, man, what do you want to jam to? And he had, you know, these big technique speakers, you know, on either side of the, the kit. And he would just stick in a tape and crank it up and just, you know, I would jam along with it. And he would, you know, just watch me play and kind of – it was – there wasn't too much – instruction it was just like let's jam some stuff every once in a while he'd come over and slap a stick out of my hand and make sure i kept playing and, oh. and reach back and grab the stick oh, like real real world practicality stuff yeah just like always always keep the groove going don't don't let anything mess with you that's man. amazing well that well that paid off for you because you know you're yeah. a work, you're a working drummer's working drummer but how did you end up getting the the rudiments and the reading together so at eight years old, I was introduced to Jeff Hennon. He and he's a local Dallas teacher. He's been there forever, um, and he was also a drum off guy. I think he went. And he won the when it was when you won the Texas drum off. I don't think at that point you could win for the state of Texas or, or something like that. So I know that was like his claim to, yeah. to fame for a while to get students and everything, but he did kind of the same thing. He would send us home with VHS tapes and, you know, we'd go home with the buddy rich stuff and, and get you hyped on it. And then <laughs> he was the first guy that put down any kind of like transcribed drum part in front nice. of me. Nice. And, uh, but man, I just, I wasn't having it. it. I met him when I was eight. And uh, at that point I was just, I wanted to learn by ear. Like I didn't see, you know, after middle school and it's, in middle school, you know, it's a whole, you have a band class period devoted to that. Yep. And it all kind of clicked. And then, then it made sense for me. And I was able to go back in my middle school days and, you know, see Jeff again and really soak in a lot of what he wanted to teach and yeah. learn about the Latin stuff and just different feels and, and, uh, and tr to try and do that authentically and, and man, it was it was that click that I always I heard the name Rich Redman, ah. and uh, and it was funny because I always had a your reputation in town was one of like oh that's one of those guys that'll cut you like he's a he's an actual really good drummer wow yeah. that's nice and uh, yeah man and I and I remember that now about them saying oh yeah Rich did the drum off and it was just well I, I you know I mean I watched your for those floating around maybe we'll put the, sh the link in the in the show notes but there is video beautifully shot of you doing the Guitar Center drum off in 2011 oh. and man there is so much dynamics so much so much thoughtful chops and there's Latin and there's funk and double bass and a lot of cool showman stuff and I was like <laughs> This kid is, I would have never known, you know what I mean? Because we don't really get to do that playing pocket we're on behind three chord country songs, you know what sure. I mean? And exactly. your, your YouTube channel is is great. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, live video cam stuff of you playing with Dustin, just taking care of business, little flourishes here and there. When you, and there's also a really funny video of you being attacked by mayflies. <laughs> like being attacked, yes. dude. I mean, oh. what, what the hell was that story? Where was that? So that was in Wisconsin, I believe. <laughs> and it was, uh, man, where, what was that city? The city will come to me it, it, and it's right, right off the water. And it's one of these things where it's like, you have to have, you have to be in that sweet spot within a few days in the year that their big mating thing happens. Oh, is it Summerfest? It's, it may have been that. What, what yeah. city is that? Yeah. I, 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 Summerfest is in Wisconsin as well. Um, I forget, but every we do it like every other Muskogee. year. In this. <laughs> is it? Oh, I think it was La Crosse. I think it was at, in La Crosse, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Amazing. Somewhere yeah. where they make cheese. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it Lots was dairy. It was so bad. And what, you know, it just, and like I had, you know, my, I think at the time I, I like I had my hair out. And you know my hair is just a ridiculous mess. If I let it just do its thing, you got some natural curls there, yeah, yeah. And man, they were just all in that. They were crawling up my legs, and I just had to play and just keep my mouth shut, power through. And yeah, and uh, I remember talking, grabbing the top back, and saying, "Please, just get the runner." 
there when we're done and take me to a shower. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to shower so bad. Poor thing. But they were like constantly like climbing on me and it was just really gross. Yeah. And it's there well, for all You time. know what I would have done? What, Jim? <laughs> I would have thrown my sticks down and said, I cannot perform under these conditions. Yes. <laughs> Don't you know me? Don't you know who I am? Yeah. I mean, you know, it'd be nice to be McHugh or something, you know? Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. Do dude, so. Or that guy, yeah. Redmond. Oh, God. No, well, no, dude. That, that that Guitar Center drum off video, just very, very impressive, dude. You got a lot of tools in the tool shed there, man. Thank and you. uh and very very impressive and you know you don't necessarily get to do that all the time utilize those things but you shared a link with me and it's really cool there's a youtube link we could put that in the show notes as well but um you did a recording called red alert with doug bossy david garfield and john pena which are some serious la fusion uh veterans how did that come about you sound great on that thing fantastic man thank you um so I did a recording for a, a local Nashville guitar player, uh, uh, Matt uh, uh, Lee, Matthew Lee. Yeah. And he's a he's one of the best chicken picking style guitar players in town. Nice. Um, and I, I think he does a lot of education, too. Like he works with Hal Leonard and does books and that kind of deal. Yeah. But uh, he was wanting to do a recording and, and he knows Doug who had recently moved here from LA. And so we used Doug's studio. And I, so that's where I met Doug the first time. And, uh, and man, Doug is just such a great guy. We've become friends and uh, awesome. We share love for golf. So we ended up hanging out some and, and just jamming and, uh, and, you know, when when the right thing comes along where he thinks, uh, you know, it might be a good fit, he'll he'll give me a shout. And and he just happened to have uh, David Garfield was coming in town to hang out. And, uh, man, we just hung out for an afternoon and, and made some music. And it was like it was, <laughs> it was really that's awesome crazy to be in that scenario. Um, oh, man. Well, you, I mean, you know, you, you 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 rose to the occasion and you shined in the occasion. I mean, Doug Boss, he is a boss. I mean, geez, oh, great players. Solo. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, there's this drum solo and there's all sorts of like Dennis Chambers and Tony Williams, Wecklish influences in there, man. And it yeah. and it floats around between like a swingy halftime and, and like straight ahead. David Garfield is doing all the that kind of like straight ahead phrasing against the backbeat. And it's just killer, man. I hope you guys get to do a whole record. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I feel lucky to be in the same company with those guys and you know, whatever I can get done. That's a Doug has thrown me some really cool work. So that's great, man. Great. And, and you got a set up at the house, a very nice setup, but uh, you're all nice yeah. up ready to go. Like most people, it's like an expectation, whatever you got to do, you got to put it on a credit card or whatever. <laughs> you just get one. <clears throat> You know, I started with a uh, an M box back in the day, and then yes. I had a uh, Digio three uh, for a while. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, I've just built on it for years. Now I'm doing the Apollo thing with. I the, think Apollo's good. That's my that's my next move. I need to upgrade some things. You know, so yeah, it's, like yeah, it's good, man. And uh, just the the technology they have with room emulation is is really great. You know, yeah, it's, it's kind of. Yeah. taking the the stress off of having to, to really spend that money on treatment and it's like you can do it within reason and and you know let the computers do a little bit of work yeah man <laughs> yeah yeah now you mentioned golf um my dad plays like four days a week he's retired down there in florida of course it's you have yeah. to go to florida once you hit 70 you must go to florida so he's down there and uh he plays four times a week and uh he's got two hole in ones have you ever done the hole in one thing oh wow isn't that crazy no. no i've been i've been pretty close you know within a foot wow. you know that kind of thing yeah uh but no never never hole in one what's your handicap um man i'm I don't really keep track, which like oh. I should because of how much we play. I mean, I we got to the point in like 2017 or 18. I think we started where we would take our clubs on the on the road and just about every place we would play. We would offer tickets to the show in exchange for greens fees. 
Oh, nice. And uh, man, so we just started playing everywhere. And, uh, you know, I can typically shoot in the low 90s or upper 80s, you know. Is which that is a par like, three, par four kind of average? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know. So, I, so, I so you're a monster at golf. At, at, yeah. I can play pretty consistent bogey golf. Yeah. Just call it that, you know. So, so it's your monster it's, at, it's, at golf. Yeah, yeah, I could say I could. I'm looking at your videos, and you emulate. I mean, you are like Dennis Chambers personified. Yeah, I hear oh, that. body <laughs> language, everything. Yeah, and I'm watching the one where you've got hair, <laughs> B- Billy Freeman at Jambo, and you're singing. Oh yeah, yeah. You're all, you're like a quadruple threat, Dude, and you're you're, you're Jason Momoa's stump double at that. Dude, yeah, if you. Huh? You know, in live shows for Dustin stuff, I've I've done a lot of the background vocal tracking. Wow. Uh, so all of our or a lot of our tracks are just me layered uh, doing all the background stuff. Cause, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a fun thing to be able to do. Uh, my wife and I actually do some uh, some work for a toy company uh, that they do a lot of uh, toys for like Cracker Barrel and the singing kind of things and uh you know they'll call us and say hey we want something that sounds like this person doing this and you know sing a tune and send it back okay. to him that is so, so i thought you were cute. gonna do foley I thought it sounded like you were doing like sound effects and foley work and stuff yeah. but this kind of voiceover <laughs> singing yeah okay wow dude that's amazing so you seem like a like a guy's been just happily married for a long time how did you meet your wife did you guys both meet in dallas or we, yeah, we did. We met in Dallas and uh, I ended up moving here um, first while we were we were still talking. And um, and yeah, shortly after I moved here, uh, she ended up moving to Nashville and we've, you know, been together ever since. All right. And you guys already do you already have one child? Yes, we have a daughter who will be seven in January. Wow. And wow. A little boy on the way in April. Got oh, a congrats. bun in the oven, man. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you been married? Um, coming up on the, actually being married, uh, three years. So. Three years and together for how long? Eight. Okay. Nice, yeah. man. Yeah. And uh, I see you're a Cowboys fan. Oh yes. Yes. <laughs> well, Rich, he said, "Hey, man, wear your favorite shirt." So I was like, "Ah, oh, you know what." I should, <laughs> and it's a, it's always just a running joke to let people know, hey, you, we are using cameras. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right. but dude, I always, rem- you know, I think when I was in Dallas, uh, we ended up, you know, I used to play with like Bill Tillman and Random Access oh, yeah. and all, all these local bands, and we would always do stuff for the Cowboys. We'd play in the big party tent outside the stadium, and it was always yeah. just packed, man, with the. Rich is a diehard Cowboys fan. Uh, You know what? I just wish I followed the sport really closely, any sport in the world, because it's such a nice icebreaker. I mean, it's just, you know. Yeah. Billy, I think you could actually, we could turn the tables on you and you could ask us some trivia questions about the Cowboys, whatever, like top three come to mind. And because Rich is such a diehard fan, I bet you he's going to be able to answer some. Well, I've been to Troy (laughs) Hickman's house. I, you know, we did a charity event in his garage. It seemed like a foot, it was like a football stadium size garage that they, turned into like you know there's like a catering yeah. team and it was oh, wow. you know all the it's plates good, they, they were like ten thousand dollar a plate yeah. you know kind of a charity event they're very deprived <laughs> the uh who so I'll, I'll start off with the first trivia question about the cowboys who owns the cowboys rich who's the owner well it used to be jerry jones is it i think still- it still is though isn't it is it still is Okay, look nice. at that. Nice. See, look at dude, that. not hold bad, on, dude. On. Ding ding ding. He's gonna look for his, some sort of sound effect. There we go. Well, I think it suppressed the background noise. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah, we chose the wrong setting on Zoom. Ding. We'll just do yeah. ding. Uh, who is the current QB quarterback for the Cowboys? I don't know that, but I know that Billy will know. And it says there on the back, go. Prescott. Back, All right. Back Prescott. I love it, man. See, I wish I followed this stuff. I really, really do. I like it. It seems like, you know, football, like football is Soccer. faster paced. You know what I mean? It's just less. Soccer is nonstop. It's just non. Yeah. I mean, you you better be in good shape to run up and down the field that many times for an hour and a half. Yeah. So yeah. what's the Nashville? I don't even know the Nashville soccer team. What's their uh, the um, 
uh, Nashville Soccer Club, I think it's what it's called. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Huh. Hey, uh, Geoda Stadium, Geoda's yeah. Park. Yeah. Brian uh, Covey has been threatening to let us use his box or whatever he's got over there. We should do it. It's a fun time. Huh. I mean, it's a really energetic crowd. We've been to one game and it's like you stand the whole time. Yeah. 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 Do they have like I've a band doing- or anything? I remember I was, I was in the band with the Nashville Predators with Kurt and Tully and we loved it. It was a hundred bucks and a hot meal and we were not going to miss it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, well, soccer is basically uh, hockey, but on grass and without sticks. Yeah. I mean, so- hockey is this yeah. constant as well. Do not mm-hmm. use your hands. That's right. It's highly frowned yeah. upon. So, Billy, um, with all that training, there's also some videos of you floating around, you know, on where you're 10 years ago, you're playing like in small, small group jazz fusion groups around Dallas and stuff. And it's just mm-hmm. killing it, man. Um, did you decide to not go to college or did you go to college? In- no, um, I actually ended up getting a really good touring opportunity pretty quickly out of high school. And it, wow. it kind of, it led to doing uh, some corporate work for Chevy. Uh, it was actually for Chevy racing. And I ended up doing uh, a lot of the NASCAR races uh, for like a Chevy band that they had put together. Nice. And um, yeah, so I, I was doing that and, and freelancing a lot in town and, and it, it, slowly you know over three or four years got to the point where i didn't have to have any kind of weird odd job or you know work at mars music anymore oh did you Uh, do that yeah yeah uh, definitely worked at mars music and i worked at spear music in garland oh yeah you just you sold there you sold instruments yep uh being that you seem to be a juggernaut at a lot of different things what was your sales record like um, I did really well at Mars. Um, mm. yeah, because you, you know, they didn't have the best business model and they, they just let the salesman kind of, you know, I could cut deals for anything anywhere. And it was just like, yeah, man, come to me. I'll hook you. And so like my sales numbers were awesome. So 75% off, man. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. Is that, is that the one thing holding you back? <laughs> yeah, yeah Jim is big on everyone having a sales job at some point in their life because it's just you'd be great at it, Rich. Oh, yeah. I'd Rich be employee of the month. Sales. I'd be employee of the month the first month, man. Greg Glazer has offered me a job at Guitar Center many a time. Has he? Yes. Oh, you'd be oh great. that's like, like the man. Yeah. He is. Yeah. When you go see Greg and he's like got his fingers, he's multitasking, he's talking to you, and he's got his fingers on the, the numeric does, keypad, you know, and he's just like Nobody answers an email faster than Greg. I mean, you get a response 30 seconds later. I mean, it's nuts. If you guys ever come to Nashville, those of you listening, and you go to Guitar Center, I don't think he's actually at the main store anymore. He's at at the uh, satellite office. He's right next to Treasure Isle. The office is right next to Treasure Isle and Berry Hill. But if you ever get a chance to meet this guy and you you follow the show Entourage, he is like an embodiment of Ari Gold but works for guitar center yes i mean he is jeremy piven yeah <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah you text him out like hey man I, I need black gaff tape black no one has black he goes so sorry bro we got white green and pink but i'll save them for you the, you know <laughs> it's like gee, you know it just right away just like crazy man no he's awesome um yeah. so 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 you you skipped the college thing but you were playing because you started so early and it was just in your DNA and it was in your family you knew what to do you picked up the sticks you know how to keep time you know how to read the room you know you knew how to take direction from people so you just were working mm-hmm. and then how did that lead to the um opportunity with um Dustin Well I uh I set my sights on uh Cowboys it was a dance hall there in Dallas and Red River a- Right, Cowboys Red River. Yeah, Cowboys Red River. Yeah, they had a location in Arlington, and there was a location in San Antonio. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I knew that. uh, So you know, we talked about uh, Wojo. Yeah, (laughs) I remember uh, when I was in middle school. He had he was auditioning for the job with Leanne. And he did that in the Garland Opry building. Wow. So my mom knew that that was going down and came and pulled me out of school. 
and was like, hey, you know, let's go up to the Opry. And I was just able to kind of sit back in the very back and just kind of watch their rehearsal and and him run the songs with them and and that kind of thing. And uh, at the time, I was playing in the house band there. Um, so it was my kit that Woj was playing on. It was a Tama uh, Swing Star. Wow. And uh, so I, when everything was done, I ended up going and saying hi and, you know, introducing myself. And, and I ended up jamming just a little bit with Curtis Randall. And uh, he was the bass player that was with her at the time. And it was like Curtis and Woj and Jerry Matheny and Milo. All Milo those hearing, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so those were like, man, those were my guys the, growing up. I just idolized those dudes because they were doing it. You know, they were out on the road with Leanne. And uh, so when I saw, you know, a handful of years later that Curtis was playing over at Cowboys and and I heard the band at Cowboys and they were just so great. Um, I, and then I thought, well, they, you know, this is one of the only places in town that has a house band and that national acts come through. Right. I thought, man, if I could just get in there and then just be around these other, you know, this next level guys that, that are coming through. And, uh, so yeah, man, I ended up, uh, talking with the, the, the guy that was in charge of the bands at the time. And I made my way into being the, the drummer for the Arlington location. And then, uh, you know, over time, the opportunity presented itself to uh, be the band leader and bring on some people I knew and, uh, and figure out what it is to put a show together, you know, and organize a band and run a rehearsal and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And, and then, yeah, that's, that's how I ended up meeting Dustin uh, was he, he came through uh, with Justin Moore uh, when he was playing the club, because at the time they shared the same management. Uh, so Dustin was just kind of there hanging out with uh, Justin's people. And uh, he wanted to hire the whole band. Amazing. Uh, and so at the time, my, the guitar player I had there and, piano player ended up leaving and moving to Nashville and playing with Dustin. And, uh, I stayed at Cowboys because it was still, and to be honest, I kept hearing, yeah, he's going to release the song Cowboys and angels. That was going to be hit, awesome. right. Yeah. And, but it was like, yeah, it keeps getting pushed. And I think next year he's coming out with it. And I'm just like, sure guys have fun with that. And, you know, I'm going to stay at Cowboys and I ended up, uh, I met Lester. Uh, Lester Estelle. Yeah. yeah, when he came through with Neil McCoy. At the time, he was playing with Neil. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and man, so I ended up uh, auditioning for Neil McCoy. And uh, so that was my first, you know, jump into the touring, the country music touring world. So you got that job with Neil? Yeah. I, well, I didn't get it right away. It was one of these things where he, he wanted me to send in videos of me playing. I sent the videos in and just be honest, he ghosted me. Ouch. And uh, it, so rather than be mad, I, I just I sent him a text and said, hey, man, you know, no pressure. If, you know, if I'm not the guy, you know, keep me in mind. If it doesn't work out, you know, I'd love to work with you. And uh Lo and behold, three months later, he said, man, I understand if you don't want to speak to me, but we'd love to have you out because the guy they hired just didn't didn't work out. And yep. so I was able to go out and I ended up being with Neil a little over a year. And uh, he just he just seems like a very likable person. He really oh, is. goodness. He sweetheart was such a great lesson in so many things and in, in what a boss on the road should be. Um, he's a great example for setting a tone for everyone's attitude for the day. You know, he would come out every day at sound check and just, he was the most uplifting person in the room and that stuff's contagious. You know, it's like yeah. yourself and you're really the same kind of energy. Yeah. And uh, that's oh, so valuable. And uh, <laughs> Jim goes, thank you. <laughs> 
in a leadership position. You know, that's just, that's so valuable. It does. It yeah. sets the whole culture of the whole organization, man. But this yes. is so impressive because you were deeply committed. You realize the power of relationships. It wasn't really about auditions and well, yeah. here, yeah, this is where I went to school. No, it was about relationships and fostering relationships. You had a killer attitude. Your skill sets were ready to go, and you were hungry for success, dude. You would are crash personified, yeah. man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's man. Really no, it's 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 all about that, and it's it's making that decision in the moment to like, you know, because you could get angry, you yeah. know, and. Yeah think you know i deserve this i sent you this work and you didn't even thank me or whatever it's like man you just gotta hope for the best and trudge along and i just i've always had the attitude of man just keep your head down and try and do good work yeah and uh yeah and you just, and you do brother and you do man thank really, you really really great and so so you end up in nashville um it was culture shock for me when I got here. You know, I missed the 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 wide streets and all the parking in Texas and all the Tex Mex and all the. There's a lot. There's a lot I miss, but there's just something very magical um, about the amount of musicians we have in Nashville and how that how it's like our greatest export is is the music business. You know, it's almost like yeah. it's a music city or something. It's like a music city. Yeah, yeah. It's weird. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, I had. I had my hands in so many different circles in Dallas. Uh, and I was, you know, I, I was so used to uh, making my living, you know, at month to month and kind of lining things out for the month. It, that faded slightly when I started the, the work at Cowboys. Yeah. Um, and then moving, you know, from Neil to Dustin, really when I started with Dustin, it's like now all of my eggs are in this basket and I'm in a new city that I don't have my hands in as many circles or any circles. Yeah. So it was very important to me to, to play with as many people as possible in my downtime and to try and be present at the, you know, loud jams and the Nashville drummer jams and, yeah. and those things. And just to, to, and not only that, but man, it's it's fun for me to soak that sort of thing in and see the guys that, like you said, we don't get to see each other play that often. Yeah. You know, but every couple of years we might get a date together or something. And then, but in these situations, you get to see guys play music that we don't always get to play and see guys stretch that you don't always get to see that out of them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was important for me just to kind of uh, find your group of people you know, in yeah. the town. And uh, it, it took two or three years sure. before I found a, you know, a group of people yeah. that you kind of relate with and, and share things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I, dude, I remember, um, I remember uh, Cowboys Red River. I mean, that is just a typical Texas honky talk in the sense that it's like, it is like Walmart size. It is a huge, uh -huh huge nightclub and you know full massive production and Al Dean's early days we used to play there you know maybe twice a year 05 06 you know that yeah. whole kind of a thing and um I do remember that uh Vinnie Paul used would come and watch the band and I remember here listening to another podcast we'll give our friend Dave a shout out there I'm drinking out of his uh. I'd, I'd hit that mug um, because we lift up all hosts and all podcasts that have to do with the drumming community. But yeah, he would sit there. He was like 10 feet away watching me the whole time. And so he would come out and see you all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. We ended up, uh, meeting through that and, uh, yeah, it was crazy. I mean, just talk about like being intimidated and that happened like the first night I saw him there. And then after you meet him and talk with him, he was just the nicest dude and, uh yeah we ended up you know exchanging numbers and just we text all the time he'd randomly send me things and because you know you just i would always assume like well yeah, this guy's not going to remember who i am and you know I, I didn't i never wanted to bother him so i wasn't hitting the guy up all the time but i would just randomly get a text from him and then we'd text back and forth for 20 or 30 minutes and just you know the sweetest yeah. dude god yeah rest soul man yeah yeah so what's the gear you're playing, man? Ludwig Zildjian Remo? Did I get it right? Yes, yes. I'm uh 
I'm actually a big Remo guy and I don't have any relationship with Remo, sadly. Like I, I just haven't pursued it. And, uh, but I love Remo. I'll push him all day long. That's the only stuff I like to play. But, uh, yeah, so Ludwig, uh, I've played all different kinds of Ludwig drums. Uh, I've had a Keystone kit out, uh, a classic maple. Here recently I had a blue, like a, an actual really old blue Vista light. Uh, wow. And then here recently uh, just switched to uh, Legacy maple. So it's the three-ply maple with the re-rings. Yeah. And it's... It's so great. It's probably my favorite kit so far. That's good, man. And you and you got a Black Beauty? Are you doing the Black Beauty thing out there? Uh, yeah, I have Black Beauty. Uh, and then I have uh, an 8x14 copper phonic kind of thing. On the side, is that for the thing? It was, and now I, I cranked it. And uh, I just have it cranked. And and because my, my main snare drum is pretty girthy. Um, just because man, so much of Dustin's stuff, he has that, you know, very sampled sounding <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of thing. And, uh, so it needs to be pretty beefy. And, yeah. uh, so I like the contrast there. It's just, I would have, if I did beefy, it would just be beefy, beefier. Uh, yeah, so totally. yeah. Have a little more contrast. Now, do you there. prefer to, to have a, to play a whole show on a beefy snare drum or do you like to have the crack? I love it. It was such an adjustment uh, to get used to playing a drum that, that doesn't feel like I want it to feel right. Um, if I had a choice, you know, if I had a choice, my snare drum would sound like Vinny's because I want it to be right. pretty snap. And, yeah. you yeah. know, and like, I like having to, I like having the choice of bringing your your stick a little closer to center and, and it sounding fat and being able to pull back and get a little skank on it. And, you know, but that's all. You can't really do anything else but just center the drum, you know, with the one I have now. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's been a bit of a, an adjustment. But, but it sounds great out front. I can't argue with the way it sounds out front. That's great. But it... Uh, yeah, it's it was an adjustment. Yeah, I like to have a crack coming back at me. You know what I mean? And and yeah, it just it just feels right. But yeah, the the tuning has gotten much lower. We're in this period of music history right now where it's like it's seventies every day. And, yeah, you know. It, well, and it's a dangerous game if you don't have the front of house guy doing things right. My problem with the a beefier sounding drum is that I feel like you can lose some of the excitement yes. that you get out of having that crack and you know and it yeah if you don't have it uh, a common vision between you know you and your, your front, front of house guy back, yeah you know yeah you can run into some trouble with that where it doesn't cut right and it you know the energy isn't there yeah man so please tell me you're not paying for drum heads that's uh the uh I don't mean you need to be to with remo me. man i mean you're a world class player dude i mean it's like Chris Hart, if you're listening to this right now, <laughs> Billy Joe Freeman should be on the Remo roster. Jeez, buddy, let's make this yeah. happen. I actually have a Remo tattoo, funny what? enough. I mean, dude, send it. I mean, <laughs> I mean I'm mean, i not that committed. That's crazy. What, you have the, the, the crown, the Remo crown on your yeah, shoulder or something? Crown. Oh, yeah. my God. Any other tattoos? <laughs> I have zero tattoos. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, just a really big thing here and, and one over here. And, uh, yeah. Is yeah. the crown that big on your, so basically for those of you listening uh, or watch, well, yeah, listening, he made a motion of his old, his entire upper arm. <laughs> so is it, it's a, it's a bunch of things and there's a, there's a smaller little crown. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Well, Rich, if you had to get a tattoo, what do you think it would be? Man. Right. That new Sabian logo is pretty awesome. But, you know, funny thing about Sabian, Rich, you know how that company was named, right? Sure. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not fill anybody you know in. Let's just keep on going. No, no, no. We're just going to keep on going. Look it up, guys. That, uh, what was this? Uh, was it Drumeo that just went through the Sabian factory tour and the whole, I forget. I think maybe it was that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Supposed to be over there and they talked about the history. There's a lot. Yeah. Man. It's Robert yeah, man. Zildjian, right? He heads up the company. Who's uh, that? No. Andy? 
Andy's, Robert, Andy's, Andy's a guy. Yeah, Andy's okay. a guy, man. Andy is amazing, dude. Yeah, dude. Um, so Andy, so uh, is he the second generation owner of it? Um, he, yeah, because he's a son. He's the son. Yeah. So second generation. Yeah. So he's the AN of and of Sabian. Yes. Right. Yeah. You could tell that Jim is a drum historian. He's he's. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like awesome. the I'm like the Cliff Clavin, just spouting useless nonsense and factoids and stuff like Dude, that. Dude, I love it. No, but we got to get you with Remo. Jesus, man. I mean, that's that's crazy. Yeah, I would love that. You're a world class yeah. world class drummer, man. Unbelievable. I um, would play at uh, Pasic. It was, you know, they had some, it was like their version of the EMAD kick drum thing. And now, let, let me ask you this. When you won, you got your Ludwig and Zildjian deal, did they come to you or did you go to them? Great question, Jim. Um, I, so after, after the drum off thing and I, uh, you know, they take you out to LA and you meet a handful of these companies and, uh, I uh, I waited until I had been with Neil for eight or ten months and, and sent out a few things and and then I sent out a few things at the beginning of uh, when I'd been with Dustin for close to a year and it just didn't work out uh, and I kind of got a little jaded on the whole thing I was like yeah I'm just gonna play what I want to play and I'm not gonna sweat it and then that's when things started you know uh, it was Kent Slucher who we were playing a show together and uh he's like man would you want to be with zildjian and said, well yeah i've played yeah. zildjian my whole life and, uh, <laughs> and he, he was like man i'm gonna make something happen and it was literally the monday we got back from the gig um i got a call from sarah hagan and uh and then the same thing man with uh with ludwig um I met Uli through Kevin, I believe. And, uh, and we, we went out to lunch together, uh, in Chicago when we were there on a thing where I think I was out with, uh, we were out with Randy Hauser on, yeah. I think it was a, some tour we were on and Kevin was with Hauser. Kevin Murphy. Murphy. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we went out to lunch and, and it, and he was like, yeah, I can't bring you on. Uh, <laughs> and he was like, but you know, stay in touch and but his whole thing was man i don't want to say yes and then not be able to do anything for you said so let's wait until i can actually take care of you and then we'll bring you on and and you know work something out and right. and yeah it's been great man i love uli and it's more of a, a personal connection with him and you know I like that. It was all very organic. Like I sold myself really hard uh, to like Sonar in the early days. And then the DW thing was pretty uh, organic because I was at Drum Channel and I was getting to know Don Lombardi. And yeah. my boss happened to be on the cover of Billboard that week. So it was just like, you know, these things that it just all works out and when it's meant to be and all that kind of. So you got to have fun. I mean, Dustin's got six albums, 17 singles and eight number one. So um, what do you guys do? Like 24 songs, 90 minutes? Kind of a thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right around there. That's yeah. a, that's the country music thing. It's like play twenty four songs, leave them wanting more. That's the mm -hmm. model, you know. What I mean, I can't relate yeah. the, the idea of doing three hours. You know, I mean, if I think I was playing with Bruce Springsteen, I would sure <laughs> want a pee break. You know what I mean? Uh, Boc, uh, Brian, yeah, that's what he always says. Like, you know, give him seventy five and the finger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See you <laughs> later. <laughs> well. Apparently your, Taylor Swift doesn't do that. Apparently, oh God, uh, yeah. she's a three-hour show, man. Oh, Dude, Matt, yeah, man, right? Matt, my did. kids, when my wife and my kids went to go see that in June, yeah, May, I think, at the stadium, yeah. at the stadium. Wow, you know it's crazy. Matt and hmm. I both started our gig on the same day. That is so cool. Oh, really? Yeah, he started with Taylor, and I started with Dustin, same time. Well, well in two thousand eight, we were out on the cmt tour with lady a and here's this great little drummer and he's like wrote a song with them and he's a great drummer and he was their trainer and then for whatever reason he gets let go and i'm like come on guys that's horrible and then like six months later i see him on playing the grammys or something with taylor and i'm like sweet <laughs> justice man look at that see good, good things happen to good people man and he's been there ever since pretty, pretty incredible yeah yeah he does. he's like the perfect guy for him man i, love really, I would him. imagine that's a good gig yeah i think yeah. so i think yeah. it's uh it's up there, you know. 
<laughs> she seems like she treats her people well. Yeah. Yeah. What I've heard. Definitely. Oh, I, I hear about it every single evening. Hey, Dad, <laughs> guess where Taylor's playing tonight? Where is she playing? I don't know, but listen to her. She's playing this song, and she took away this song. And oh my gosh, she's playing the secret. Also, song. your like, your kids oh have my. the fever. They got oh, the fever. Uh, dude. Okay, yeah, it's one hundred and ten percent. Both Cammy and Hallie. Wow, <laughs> you know, and Hallie didn't want to go, and she ended up like just completely falling out. Uh, like every time we're going to school, we got to put on Taylor Swift. Okay. Well, Jim, oh. Jim, you're in it, buddy. I yeah. That's cool, man. That's cool. And what's your favorite song to play during during the evening, buddy? Is there one you get to stretch on or one that just feels right? You love the pocket. You know, I've been feeling uh, Heart of Rock and Roll by Huey Lewis in the News lately, Rich. Uh, it's a really good fun. Oh, you're oh, you're asking Billy. Sorry. Never mind. Man, I you know, uh actually what's fun is Cowboys because they're it's such a dynamic tune. The very first single? Yeah, Cowboys and Angels. Yeah. It's fun, and it's fun because you just, and that's also uh, there could be a handful of songs that we don't have any tracks or even a click on. Nice, uh, but that yeah, we don't play with any tracks or any click. It's just that's the one song that like we're gonna be a band and yeah. just click her off. And isn't that nice? And, and and that's the one that has that a bar of three, bar of four thing, right? Yeah. Bar uh -huh. of three, bar of four. You know, whatever you got to do in Nashville to fit that lyric in, we're going to do it. You know what I mean? Let's, <laughs> let's add a beat. Let's chop a beat. It doesn't matter because the vocal and the storytelling are king. And that's what's a lot of, you know, folks that move here from other genres, they quickly realize, man, turn up the vocal in your ears. That's who's cutting your check. That's the melody, you know? Man. And You know, that was so much of, I, I feel blessed with, being able to do the the opry thing at a young age because you know our format having 12 to 15 singers every night that's what i had blasting in my monitor was the the guest singers vocal always because, yeah. like the the whole thing was to make them feel as comfortable as possible you know and it, it, man i feel like that's a something that doesn't get talked about a lot but you know, so important for drummers, especially, is to be reading the room musically, you know, wh while you're playing to understand how to make each player more comfortable, you right. know, those little cues, you know, because there are players and singers will give you a number of unconscious cues before they actually have to turn around and tell you whatever. You know? Now that's amazing. So, what are some of these unconscious cues? We're talking about like foot tapping, thumbs oh, up, anything, thumbs down. You know, you have the bass player who maybe isn't facing you, but you start seeing him do this thing, and you know, you might be able to tell. Like, I think maybe I might be pulling it back a little more than he's used to, gotcha. and he's wanting to us to be on top of it a little more. And and when you adjust slightly. Lots of times you'll see him turn around and, and give you the nod, like, thank you for doing that. And nothing ever needed to be said or, and, you know, it didn't reach the, and it's more important for me with the, the lead singer, because it, you know, you run into these situations where, you know, if they're forced to lose their connection with the crowd and have to turn around and give you direction, you Ouch. fail, yes. you know? It, and you need to pick up on those things that happen prior to that. And so you avoid that, you know, because like, I feel like there are so many levels that you reach because they'll, they'll give you those unconscious cues first or maybe audible cues and they're singing where they're pushing their vocal and you realize or they're dragging their vocal and they're, they're having a hard time getting all the words out. So you need to pull it back. You need to listen for that. If you're not listening for that, they might then start throwing you some, you know, these behind the back kind of cues or speed it up, you know, these kinds of things. And, and that's the second level. It's like, you've already kind of failed on the listening end. So now they've had to turn around and, or maybe not turn around yet, but give you the hand cues. And if you're not picking up on that and they have to completely lose that connection and look at you, well, then yeah. that's like, You've really you've failed a couple of times at that point. That's pretty profound, man. That you failed. Wow, dude. Yeah, you have. Yeah, because the whole a, thing is to have that connection with the crowd. And if they're having to focus on you, like that's just a 
Yeah, it is. It's a failure on your part. And yeah. you become more sensitive to that in a, in a situation where, where myself, anytime I'm not with Dustin, I'm in that supportive role. I'm a sub. And, and so I'm just constantly scanning for like, what are these people used to? Yeah. And I'm giving them what I think is appropriate, but is this what they've been playing every week? Or? Who, you, who you been subbing with? Um, I play a lot with the West Cook band here in town. Um, I have a little jazz thing, Eddie V's. That oh, I do you? That's fun. great, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun, man. Just, what do you, when uh, do you play Eddie V's? Is it like a little trio or something or? Yeah. It's a trio on, uh, some Tuesdays and Thursdays whenever wow. I can make it happen. I got to watch for that. So what are you calling it? Is it the. Uh... Man, it's, it's a couple of, it's usually with uh, David Lukens and Chris Croce. Um, just a couple of good players in town and, and, you know, we play like jazz versions of pop songs and I like that. Yeah. I, I try to keep it brushes all night and, uh, kind of, it helps to bone up on that stuff. You know, it's, you don't always get to play a whole night on brushes oh. and that helps, you know? Sure. It's man. great. Yeah. You get the, the long yeah. note. Everything is legato. It's great. Jim, did yeah. you have a question or an insight? Bud? Yeah. Getting back to the, uh, you described, like my brother and I are both musicians. He's a, a piano player up in Michigan. He plays with two tribute bands. And I got a question for you about that in a bit. Do you believe what's your philosophy about playing? Cause you talked about, you know, reading the cues uh, of the band and stuff like that. But at the same time, the drummer is the driver of the band. Correct. <laughs> you drive that ship that, that, you know, absolutely. And, and do you feel like you fail if you all of a sudden start Okay, you know, you got so many inputs happening. Well, okay, guys, I need to be the arbiter here. I got to make this decision for everyone. But obviously, the singer's the boss. I got to, you know, pay attention to him and make those kinds of adjustments in real time. Is that the philosophy pretty much overall? Yeah. And it, it but it can be a complicated thing because uh, I've learned lessons the hard way where, you know, you grow up playing with a certain style of musician. And then you're into a situation where you're playing with some maybe R&B guys and the bass players laying the beat back farther than you're used to, but it's a stylistic choice. He doesn't want you to follow him. Your mm -hmm. job is to keep it straight and he's going to play behind almost like a D'Angelo kind of thing. Yeah. And if you've, if you've slowed down 20 clicks by the end of the tune because you're being influenced too much by that, and, or you're in your head too much and you're thinking, man, I'm, you know, he's wanting me to pull this back. You know, that it, it can be complicated and you yeah. can get in your head too much about it. And that's where you just have to know the music you have to know. And, and that's another reading people thing, you know, it's just like I said, reading the room. Who but yes, it can be, it, it's a fine line because, yeah, that is your job. And and yeah. uh, and I do have a problem with like if a singer turns around to me and it's the second verse and he's telling me slow down. Right. So that ship has sailed, man. <laughs> like, yeah. you know. But I mean, even, you know, for a younger player to adapt that kind of skill, it's, it's, it's really like a life skill because, you know, being what our, our, my, not my day job, but one of the, the, the company I own here, we're in a, a, a lighting company, but occasionally do installations and stuff like that. I did electrical work back when I was 18, 19, 21. And I just remember early on that if you're helping somebody, if you're a helper, which, you know, as a side man, that's what you are. You know, you're a helper to the main act uh, to be able to anticipate the next step and make sure the lead has got the tool that they're going to need, the part, that kind of thing. This yes. is kind of the same thing, you know, it's uh, and that's what we kind of impart to our young people here is that if you're going to be helping, you have to anticipate the next like it's like chess reading yes. a couple of steps ahead, right? Absolutely. So if anybody's listening uh, and you're coming to town, hell of a skill set to develop early on. Pick up yeah, on the yeah. cues, right? Be, pick up on, read the room and be a problem solver. I mean, that's what we yeah. do as drummers. We're problem solvers. But yeah, man, oh, speak, yeah. You know, sp speak, speaking about those gigs, you know, where you are not on a click and yeah. it's organic and you're following body cues when somebody asks you to speed something up or slow something down, that is just a really difficult thing. Once you've mm -hmm. internalized the time and then you've got to make an adjustment yeah. and then try to protect that new thing. Well, and, difficult, and it's, man. Some, 
with with new groups I've never worked with, I always because you never I, I think of things sometimes I think, well, everybody knows that. Right. Well, there are guys that don't. So, you know, what I try and tell guys, if it's the first time I'm playing with them and, and they're not sure about a tempo or they're not they question things, I'll say, hey, sing the chorus, sing the chorus in your head. Don't try and sing the intro to yourself. Sing the hook, you know, yes. get your tempo from the hook. And then let's click her off, you know, bro. That's just, my same advice, man. Great. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's what the soccer mom remembers. And that's what people are going to dance to. And that's the main idea behind the whole song. Soccer yeah. mom or football mom, football mom, my friend. Bringing yeah. it back. Oh, my <laughs> um, getting back to my, uh, the second part of my question, the, um, I'm, I'm enamored by tribute bands. So Billy, let's say you're walking down the street and some guy comes out of an alley and says, Hey, you come here. Mm -hmm. you got to pick a band to be in a tribute band for otherwise tomorrow your entire career comes to a crashing halt who's the tribute band you're going to be in Oof. who's steely it for dan. steely dan steely yeah. dan oh, nice. yep. yeah because you get to honor the legacy of all those great drummers mm. a high level yeah. of musician so you have all the records are you just like oh yeah oh yeah very much i could do that and meet like tonight and right. just be you know on it that's what unbelievable about you, what's now, that what about you that? oh you want to know what kind of tribute band i would want to be in hmm i wish you know, i had I'll, just... ex I'll expand the question what about yeah. a stylistic cover band you know a oh. 90s kind of rock alt, alt rock or something you know something like that i'd love to be in like a, a seven like a, a anything from 70 to 79 you know and it okay. would be like classic rock and one classic hit rock. wonders you know classic yeah. rock that's right yeah today's rock uh if it had to be a tribute band what would it be the police no you i know what i know yeah. what it is yeah john, police, really? Dude. really yeah i was gonna say john mellencamp i mean mellencamp i could do that yeah for sure because yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, I had an opportunity recently. One of my bucket list items is that pathetic as it sounds is to be in a Huey Lewis and the news tribute band. I, that's not crazy. I think, yeah. Oh my gosh. Really yeah. is. They're an amazing band yeah. uh, and they're, it's fun music, you know, hit after hit after hit. So I meet a guy not uh, about two months ago and uh, he comes to my net, my business networking group and uh, he owns a flooring company. He's from California. And he says, I hear that you're uh I play in a band. I said, oh, really? He goes, what kind of a band? He goes, I'm in a Huey Lewis and the News tribute band. I said, you got to be <laughs> freaking kidding me. And he goes, no. I said, so the Huey, he's got to look and sound like him. And he goes, the Huey is my brother. And he looks and sounds just That's like amazing. him. amazing. <laughs> and I'm going, really? Do and you Jim's know like, you drummer? just found your new drummer. I'm your new drummer. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've been hounding this guy. I said, look, I, and they've got a guy who's uh, who's playing. He, they got like an East Coast version of the band and a West Coast because they're based out of California primarily. But the East Coast guy is a player around here. Um, I'll try to find his name. But he's solid. He's solid. I said, look, if you ever, you know, needs to call out or something like that, need somebody to sub in. I said, let me know. Give me a shot. I'll be I'd love to do it. I Jim is a so great natural drummer. He's a great natural drummer, and he doesn't earn his money from that, so he can really just have enjoy fun. it, and he doesn't it doesn't have to be burnt out and stuff. But Billy, you've checked a lot of boxes, man. You're here in Music City. You know, you got a great roof over your head, you're raising your family, playing with this high level recording act. You get your gear for free, man. It's all great stuff. <laughs> you checked yeah. a lot of boxes. You play the Grand Ole Opry. You hear yourself on the radio. What's next? What are some other things you want to get done? Uh you know, it's it's always scary to take that leap from being known as being on the road a lot. Uh, and and I grew up reading liner notes, you know, and, and connecting the dots through doing that. Uh, so I, I just have so much respect for, for, you know, the Lonnie Wilsons and the Eddie Bears of the world and, and that whole. And, I, you know, I really enjoy producing. Uh for some artist friends of mine and, and being involved in uh, what's up man yeah oh god technology uh, i thought my computer was plugged in but it died and in the process we lost jim he had to go pick up his kids from school or some activity or something i don't know <laughs> soccer dad you know football dad uh but anyways man i think we were just talking really quickly about um 
all the amazing boxes that you've checked in this decade you've been in Nashville and maybe some things you were like looking to do in the future. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's always the, uh, a big leap to kind of make the jump from doing, uh, touring and, and to doing studio stuff. And like we talked about the other day, it's like, they always want to put you in a box. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man, I just, I, I grew up reading, uh, liner notes and connecting the dots through all that, you know, figuring out who played with who and, and, uh, so man, I just have so much respect for the guys that do that in town and yeah, hope to kind of build on what I've already got going here at the house with some production and, and, you know, doing some songwriting and that sort of thing and try to, you know, just, you want to, we're all creatives, you know, (laughs) so try to do something creative every single day, man. And, you know, that's like when I got, uh, you know, I got to my, midlife crisis at 45 and i got so much slack and hate from drummer buddies that were like why would you be going to la to study acting i mean it's so late in life but he's like you know if you want to do something you're pulled to do it you do it you know and uh man i see you doing tons of sessions man you know you might as well get a kid over there at drum paradise you know build it they will come you know put a put a kit in cartage next thing you know you start getting the calls you know and um that's kind of my philosophy. When I moved to town, I was like, I'm going to do everything, man. I'm going to teach, I'm going to tour and I'm going to record and, uh, you know, build it and they will come man. So I see that happening for you and such, you're such a great singer and you know, so many other great musicians. Yeah. You, sh- you should write, man. And if you don't need the money from a publishing company, then you could just write and then you keep a hundred percent of it. Yes. Yes. Which is great. Um, I've been lucky to get uh, a couple of cuts on a, a friend of mine's uh, record here recently, and yeah, so that's it's been great, man. And I've, I've been really fortunate for guys to include me in their circles, and yeah, it's tough when you can't be here all the time to do that sort of thing. But it's yeah, it's great. How's the, how well, who's that artist? Should we be on the lookout? Uh, Dan Smalley. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, so he he's he's got some things rolling here in town, and yeah keeping an eye on him yeah next thing you know he's he's got a big old yeah he's got a big deal and you got cuts on every one of his records moving forward you know through the relationship yeah Yeah, man he's another uh, cowboys alum so oh yeah look at that man yeah there's someone in the water there in arlington yeah (laughs) well listen man you've been so generous with your time you know i really just wanted to shed this light on you know you for people who just might have their head in the sand. They don't know who you are. Hopefully they'll listen to this and go, I got to check this guy out. But hey, usually we close out with the, the fast five. So your five favorite things. Some of these are pretty hard. It's okay. Favorite song. Do you have a favorite song? Wow. Um, boy, that's a really good question. I like, uh, um, how about, Paul Simon, um, something so right. Okay. Or actually, you know what? How about Train in the Distance? Paul and Simon. That, Paul Simon, Train in the Distance. And is that like a GAD thing? I got to check it out. I think I want to say Train was uh, that may have been Picaro, but it's it's literally all. And it might be GAD. I can't remember which one it was, but uh, it's all kick and hat. He's just boom, doom, 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 doom just all the way through it's just not much drums to it but it's awesome oh okay i gotta check that out i tell everybody hey one of my favorites is you know missing you by john wade and it's just because it's been it's been recorded 80 times for a reason it's just got a great thing to it you know yeah, Love the track. yeah. i'll have to check that out man can you faith band i think in steely dan is am i right yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd go with Steely Dan. Steely Dan, favorite band. Either that or, or Little Feet with Lowell George. Okay. That iteration of Little Feet. Yeah, it'd be one awesome, of those. brother. Favorite movie? Woo! Um, let's call it Casino. Oh, okay. Yeah, man. Yeah. Over and over. Repeat viewing. Um, yeah. fa- favorite food? Do you have a favorite food or dish? Woo! Um, man, uh, I really like, uh, some good barbecue, uh, but you know, we get that all the time. I'm going to go ahead and call it just Mexican, uh, solid Tex-Mex is probably. Oh, I miss the Tex-Mex. All right. So when you get back to Texas, what's the spot? Is it like, uh, 
Man, we have uh, my wife has one in Fort Worth that she likes, but we usually just try to make it to Papacitos. Come on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Papacitos, Papa, Papa D. Yeah, <laughs> they ru- they rule Texas, man. The Papas, whoever they are, the the Cito family, they're they're everywhere. Um, yep. and then a favorite drink, man. Your favorite, you know, it could be a, a boring liquid or it could be a, your favorite cocktail. Um, yeah, man. Uh, probably just uh, Jack and uh, or Crown and Seven Up, just whiskey and Seven Up. Whiskey and Seven. Favorite. I think I made one uh, one for you backstage when we saw each other in New Jersey. Yeah, well, one of the one of those places. <laughs> Yep. Well, man, thanks for putting up with the technology and for spending this time with us, man. And uh, I really appreciate it. And let you know, let's get out there. Where do we eat uh, Mexican here in um, Nashville? What's your spot? Yeah, right. There's one up here in White House. Uh, in uh, actually, there are like two or three different Mexican restaurants up here. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're you know they're here and there. White House. All right, man. You get some more for your buck up there, man. Right. Oh yeah, for sure. You don't have to wait. Lines, it's great. Oh, dude, I love, I love it. I mean, we'll have to. We'll. Hey, hey I got to clean this. Cr- I'm in my studio right now, and I got to clean it. So maybe we could see each other's uh, studios, have a cocktail. But uh, man, happy holidays. Hopefully, this will be out really, really soon. Thanks for spending right. time with us, man. I really appreciate it. And best wishes so for yeah. the new addition to your family and a great tour next year. Hopefully, we'll end up in the same city somewhere. Yes, I hope so. Brella, I appreciate it. And hey, to all the listeners out there, uh, first of all, thank you for Jim McCarthy. Jim McCarthy for his time and talent. We love him. And uh, to all you listeners out there, we really appreciate it. Be sure to rate and review the show. It helps people find it. And until next time, we'll be here. We'll see you next time, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Billy. Thank you, Rich. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts. 